So we'll go to number five. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of March 4th, 2013? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And now we'll move to the report, a report from the fire department and EMS. Sounds good. This is the fastest meeting I think I've ever been at. That we're already in number six and less than a minute in. So thank you. Um, so, so I just wanted to give you an update on a few uh, fire things, and Chris will sort of go over the EMS things that we've been working on. It's actually been uh, some pretty exciting things with a major program moving forward today uh, as its first day that he'll talk about. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, since the last time I've been here, we had the experience of the blizzard. Uh, that, that was a wonderful experience for our department, and I just wanted to sort of publicly thank not only Deputy Chief Davin, but his entire shift. Uh, that, that was really some adverse conditions, worse than I saw in the blizzard of 78 or any other storm we've had, in that we had city EOC up and running all day. We were in there. Um, I was there until about think, 8 or 9 at night and went home and plowed and continued to do so. Uh, and I think the last time I was outside was about midnight. And about 2.30, uh, the guys woke me up and said, there's four feet of snow in front of both stations. We can't respond to calls. Um, so they, they were very good at not only putting their own uh, effort into shoveling and getting things out, but taking our plow that usually can handle pretty much anything that was stuck and trying to get that freed up, working with DPW, and we very quickly put in a four-wheel drive unit with a uh, Stokes basket and hose lays in it to get in quickly to a fire medical scene, and then back that up by larger apparatus that would be out on one of the major streets. Uh, and that, that proved sort of a very good strategy. We had one call where it was approaching an hour by the time the plows cleared enough of a way to get a, a Ford Expedition into the scene. And it was a uh, carbon monoxide event where the, the vent had frosted over with the snow piling up against the building. Um, so we, we had a number of serious calls, but <clears throat> I think the thing really is just recognizing that our people really did a great job. So, so I'm trying to give you a little blurb on that update. Um, we're in the process, uh, final design on a new engine that was approved through capital planning, so uh, that's very appreciated. Um, that will be about seven months from now uh, is when it will be delivered. So it's uh, final drawings are done, it takes about seven months to fabricate. Uh, and with that, we've placed our existing unit that's going to be traded in um, on sort of an auction site specific to fire apparatus. We had done something with a company called municibid.com, uh, but municibid is really anything a government has to surplus, and we might get 10, 15,000 for it. Uh, doing it this way, we've already had an offer of $50,000 that I've turned down for the time being. So uh, it is worth somewhere around 50 or $60,000, and that's something I'm gonna need your support on because as we crafted this project, some of the money for the equipment to equip the new vehicle is with the sale of the old vehicle. In, in years past, what we'd do is we'd trade it in, um, but some, sometimes when we trade it in, we don't get the best value. And in this case, we couldn't trade it in because we used a statewide purchasing program that we, we weren't allowed to sort of trade it in on as that went forward. But in doing so, we used bids from 2010 and we're able to save the city about $50,000 compared to going out to bid for the piece of fire apparatus on our own. Um, so, so that's something that's uh, in process. Um, we were fortunate to receive two grants in the last couple of months. One is a $7,500 grant to complete some technology and projects uh, related to the Emergency Operations Center and continue to sort of build that out so it has more redundancy uh, and sort of take the lessons that we've learned over the years uh, specifically the October snowstorm we had when a number of systems failed in the city and sort of build those out. So that's uh, well underway. And we were able to receive another uh, small grant for, from the insurance company, the city's insurer, to take some of the street lights or traffic lights that have what's called an Opticom emergency preemption system in them. So if you're driving an ambulance or a piece of fire apparatus or a police cruiser, as you approach, the lights theoretically will change in your favor so you can continue at a reasonable pace. Um, what these lack is that they don't have a signal that tells the operator that they've been activated or in the process of cycling. So if you, 
notice most Damon Road, most of the new lights have that Route 9 corridor. Um, so that should pretty well do the entire city with what's already in place, the state, and our efforts that will have those signals so as you, the drivers approach an intersection, they'll know if the system is in the process of working and be able to gauge their response appropriately. The signal on the Opticom? Um, yep, uh, O-P-T-I-C-O-M. Yep. And it's an emergency preemption system. It's driven off uh, strobe lights that operate at a certain frequency. Uh, that will trigger it. And how much money was that? Uh, that was a $5,000 grant. Wow. Okay. And that will be mostly for equipment? Yeah, that's mostly for equipment. We're working with central services and the city electrician to install those. So, but, but I thought that was really important. Though. That's one of the key things that I could see really avoiding an accident. Uh, so, um, let's see. We're... Uh, also in process of moving forward on some technology implementing a secondary recall system. So right now we have radio-based pagers that when there's a fire, they will tone out and they'll alert and people will come in. As people have sort of matured into smartphones, we find fewer and fewer people carrying the pagers. Um, so what we're in process of basically taking a smartphone and making it a pager that when the tone goes off, it'll actually call them. And when they answer it, it will play the tone and the announcement and so forth. So sort of leveraging technology. And uh, we're actually buying fewer and fewer of the regular pagers, keeping that as sort of the primary system, but then building off of that into this other system. And I think it will really help our recall numbers. Uh, and then the final thing, just wanted to let you know that the uh, arbitration, sort of the, the firefighters have been without a contract for a number of years, as we all know. I think it's three at this point. Uh, we just spent about 36 hours in arbitration, I think was the final total between prep and delivery and stuff over a three-day period. That is completed, uh, and just from the council perspective, you should expect to see an award coming through the state within the next 60 to 90 days. Um, so, so those are the highlights I had. What? An award? Yeah, an award where the arbitrators uh, sort of put forward what should be. Oh, but we don't know what that is. We, we don't, don't know, know what that is. Okay. So. so, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and then uh, we'll go into the EMS section. <coughs> no questions? Okay, Chris, you're up. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanted to first start off and just give everyone a brief overview of the fiscal year in terms of call volume and some other demographics pertaining to the service we're providing here in Northampton. Um, what I handed out to you gives you that snapshot overview from July 1st, 2012 um, through yesterday. And you can see in the upper right-hand corner in bold letters 3,247, that is the total number of calls during that time period. Um, to break that down further, when you start looking at some of the graphs, some of the important ones to know, of those 3,247 calls, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, it says ALS, BLS, 58% of those calls have, been, have necessitated ALS response, and 42% have necessitated the BLS response. Um, ALS being uh, some more advanced therapies such as IVs, advanced airways and medications, cardiac monitors, things of that nature. The other one to take note of is the next box, the middle box in the top row. Um, disposition, and it talks about transport and non-transport. So out of that 3,247 calls, not all calls require that patient to be transported to the hospital. There, there's refusals. Refusals can be anywhere from, I always use the example of a diabetic emergency where we go, we treat the patient, and throughout that treatment, they become conscious, alert, orientated. They're 18 years of age or older here in the state of Massachusetts, and they don't want to go to the hospital. They have the right to refuse treatment. In that 
dissent and wrong refusals, are there are there um, cases where you where you show up and don't recommend that they be hot and recommend they don't be hospitalized, or is every one of those a refusal? Those that thirteen percent is the patient saying they choose not to be transported to the hospital. They may not go at all, or they may transport themselves or have another means of transportation to the ER, but they don't want to go via ambulance. We, for the most part, if we get called to the scene of emergency 911, most of the time we'll do our assessment, and through that assessment, we're going to recommend them to go based on the nature of the call. Um, but out of that 32, 47, um, 13% of those are refusals, um, non-transports. Most of the time you show up, you, you will transport by practice. Absolutely. And it's actually, given what we're seeing here um, in this snapshot of time, this is actually, the transports are a little bit higher than what we typically see. When you look at trends, it's actually more of a closer to an 80-20 split uh, based off historical data um, from our call volumes in previous years. So this time period that I just happened to pull just happens to be a little bit higher. Um, and then in the bottom row, the far, uh, the two right-hand boxes, IVs and ETs. Um, the ETs is the uh, basically esophagus, um, putting a tube uh, down someone's throat if they need an advanced airway, and the endotracheal tube. So under IVs, um, we have just over um, a 70% success rate, and for the endotracheal tubes, we're looking at uh, and 84% success rate. And understand that those can be misleading a little bit because a lot of times you may come across someone who has poor vasculature and you may have to try, given the nature of the call, three times and you may have three misses on the same patient. So there's a difference between if I had 100 people and missed 28 times compared to I had 100 people but only 10 of those people we couldn't get, and a couple of those were multiple times. So overall, um, the skills are continuing to be proficient out there. Um, Dr. Conway, our medical director, continues to provide uh, quality assurance and oversight, and he's extremely happy with what he's seen so far. The on-scene times, are those, are those numbers, have they, have they been staying constant? Is that pretty typical? They, they have. Um, and I'll actually, the on-scene times, that's typically what the, the trends is pretty constant to what's in front of you right there. Uh, those, don't, those don't deviate too much um, throughout um, the years. Can I ask you, because I, I just happened to my computer in front of me, so I pulled up the report from last year, which is almost exactly uh, the same date. What you find when you look at the basic one, that one will have a greater deviation if, because of, we talked about earlier, the refusals. Those are considered basic calls because obviously we're not, perform, we're not performing any treatment. So it's a basic level call. So there I'm seeing sometimes getting multiple patients for like a car accident. So in terms of having, you would think a paramedic would be on scene more because they can do more therapies on scene. But in terms of it's almost reversed because a lot of times those refusals kicks that number up because they're getting multiple refusals on the scene and then in essence requiring them to stay there longer. How's total calls from last year? Because it seemed like the call count went down a little bit over the last year. We are a little bit down in calls overall from last year. Oh, what was total calls last year since you got I do, I have, well, it, it, it's not perfect because it misses 30 days basically, but it, it was 30, 68 last year. So, 3247, so it probably is down. Down a little bit. Yeah, it, it is. And that's been trending for a while, hasn't it? Because we peaked a while ago, and it's been slowly going down. We peaked a while ago, two years ago. Um, we did have a, you know, it's kind of a peak in terms of call volume and severity of calls. So that year, our revenue collections were actually pretty significant compared to what we 
anticipated. Um, and then since then, it's come down based obviously, number one, on decreasing call, decrease call volume. And then when you look at that ALS, BLS split, that depends ultimately on what the ins uh, insurance carriers can be billed as well. And any insights yet on why Tuesday at 1 o'clock is such a high time? It, 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 <laughs> it's still that, there. That, that segues into... Uh, <laughs> Saturday's still going. Yeah, yeah, so... Yeah, two, I mean, you'd expect the weekend to be mayhem, but right. Tuesday at 1 o'clock. So the weekend, uh, again, during that snapshot of time, Saturdays are the busiest between people being out, weekend nights, things like that. Um, so that's always interesting to look at. And then the other one I put in there for you folks is the time of day. And again, just as a reminder, when you look at that, so we're still staffing two ambulances at the paramedic level 24-7. And then we have that third ambulance, that impact shift, staffed um, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And you can see that's what we're looking at. It helps uh, meet the needs of that high demand peak call volume during those hours. So that trend has been consistent for us from day one. Well, that's when people are out moving around. Right? Correct. Yep. Crashing into stuff. And then the last one, the last page um, that I like to bring before this group just to keep you updated is the overall response times and in terms of um, where it meets the overall percentages. And ultimately, when you look at that, we're arriving on scene um, in basically overall less than nine minutes, about 89% of the time. And uh, so we're, we're hovering right around 90% for all the calls. And again, when you look at that, that also includes, this is an overarching look. So that's looking at all of the ALS intercepts and mutual aid calls we do to other communities as well. So in terms of response times, um, both looking at it department-wide and from a medical perspective view, um, response times have been excellent. I'd really be interested in if you remove the out-of-city stuff, like intercepting Hilltown or, you know, the ones where clearly you're going further than your average municipal call. That would probably raise that percentage. We've recently done that um, through the mayor's initiative with the city staff program. Um, we're doing a more detailed analysis as we move forward, and that's one of the ones we've looked at. When we pulled that last time, the in-city response was around 4 minutes and 30 seconds. Um, and that's obviously based off of, you know, we have two static deployment points in both stations, mm -hmm. but I tell people we really have three, the third one being the hospital. Because when we're up there, they're doing, they transfer care over to the hospital staff, and they're back, and they're back in service, they're completing the paperwork up there, but a lot of times they're deployed from 30 Locust Street throughout the city. So those are the three main deployment points that we typically will see. And what will happen as well, as ambulances become available at the hospital, if they hear a call that they're closer to, they will take that call and cancel the other ambulance. So they're, they're very good at sort of self-initiative on that. So in city, it's about half of, you know, the, you, when you say most of your stuff's under nine minutes, within the city, it's, um, it's like half of that. So. Oh, absolutely. And you need to take in perspective, we have agreements with all the surrounding communities. I mean, so we can go as far as Go Goshen, um, Huntington, and they were over in Sunderland today. So those are, those um, bring in some pretty significant response times out there. Um, so when you look at just Northampton, um, we, the personnel have done a good job in, in getting there and doing what they're trained to do. And kind of segue into um, the next topic, for the past probably about year and a half at least, um, one of the things that we've looked at when we reviewed our data through um, our software programs is response times. And since we've been doing EMS, the engines have responded to medical calls in addition to ambulances to the most severe 25% of calls. And when you look, when you break out that 25% of calls that the engine responds to, over a year's time frame, they arrived on scene 20% of the time prior to the ambulance. And it deviated anywhere from a minute, two minutes, up to eight minutes. So when we looked at that, we said, okay, the engine's getting going to these calls, they're getting there first a fifth of the time, and it's staffed with paramedics. But I wasn't doing my job in getting them the equipment they needed to do their job, what they were trained to do. So through a series of grants and other 
um, <laughs> initiatives today, we finally imp implemented the paramedic engine companies. Um, essentially what that means is we have a license through the state, so both engine out of each station, now when staff with a paramedic can respond at the paramedic level and deliver paramedic therapies just as an ambulance could. The only difference being they can't transport the patient. So for example, um, if uh, someone's having chest pain in Florence and that engine staff with a paramedic, they go to the call, the ambulance goes, if they get there three, four, five minutes before the ambulance, they can start all of their advanced therapies <coughs> while waiting for the ambulance to arrive. So it does two things initially. Number one, it delivers a higher service of, of care and the highest level of care pre-hospitally to the patient quicker. And it goes back to looking at on-scene times. Theoretically, it should decrease on-scene times because now, instead of the engine getting there and doing basic therapies, the ambulance get there and have to do all the ALS stuff. Now, some of that's already being done. So the ambulance gets there, some things are done, get them out and get them to the hospital. So, so those, is it just equipment then that, that made the difference? It's, it's essentially equipment, medications, cardiac monitors, um, and then the license through the state. So okay. when, when did you get the license? The license was part of the overall license for the department that was issued in October with the understanding that the state be notified when we implement the actual paramedic portion, which the state and Dr. Conway were notified last week. So um, that is all done. Um, we put everything in service today and um, we're very excited about that. And as the chief and I told the personnel and, and they understand, is this something that's going to be used on every call? No, it's not. But it's that one time that someone's having severe chest pain or difficulty breathing that they're going to be there and they have the tools and resources to do the job they're trained to do now. And the other big component is we haven't relied on mutual aid coming to the city a lot. We've actually been pretty self-sufficient in handling all the calls. But from time to time, particularly during the overnight, we have to rely on mutual aid for a couple of calls. So when you have an East Hampton coming in because Pioneer Valley may be the unavailable, um, they come into the city, it's a longer response time for them. So now that engine and those personnel are sitting on scene sometimes 10 minutes with a paramedic, but they didn't have the equipment to do what they're trained to do. Now we have that for them. Um, so we're excited about it. Um, we're gonna monitor that as we go forward. Dr. Conway um, is extremely excited about it. And it's actually starting to get some attention region-wide as well. I got a phone call from Amherst last week wanting me to go over there and meet with them next week to talk about how we set it up. Um, West Springfield has all of my information on how we set it up as well. And then talking to Dr. Conway, in terms of the state, he believes that um, we're one of two in the state that have uh, engines licensed as paramedic EFRs. So at what point on an overnight, if the paramedics are there but they're assigned to a mission company, and there's an ambulance sitting there because you don't have your swing shift and there's another vehicle around, at some point would they take that ambulance rather than an engine? If in fact their qualified guys are there, they're just assigned to an engine company. That essentially, we've been working through that and trying to analyze how that will work. We had the two staff 24-7. The balance that we're continually trying to find is to maintain our fire suppression coverage and EMS. I, I've always said one of the best benefits this community has is the hospital in our backyard. So in terms of being out of service, we get an ambulance call. From the time we go to that call, transfer care work to the hospital, typically about 45 minutes. You look at Amherst, they get a call, they're gone for two hours. So we can turn ambulances back in service quicker. So we have that advantage of number one, not running five ambulances around the clock. We can get away with two or three and find that balance of maintaining an appropriate fire suppression force that's actually credible here in the community given all the hazards uh, in the buildings we have. And then the other thing we will do, if the second ambulance, or as the second ambulance goes out at night, we'll recall two people 
the goal of that program is to bring two people into staff the third ambulance. So sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on what success we get with the recall and sort of their skill level and how we can move people around. But the goal is to maintain a minimum of two fire suppression units and then bring people back for that third ambulance. But there, there are times when we're four or five ambulances deep, both during the day and at night, depending on sort of what's going on. So, so I'm sorry, I missed so. Yeah, can I just, um, I'm just curious about the on-scene times, because I'm also just looking at last year. <coughs> Priority one will be mostly those are your most severe calls. Oh, okay. That's gone down. I mean, went up basically. Last year was at 17 minutes. Now it's at 34. Yeah, those are the most severe calls. So those are your cardiac arrest, um, things of that nature, uh, multi-system trauma, car accidents, things like that. And, and some of that is situational. For for example, we had a call on South Street where. A gentleman was in cardiac arrest on the third floor, and it took us about eight people, eight to ten people, to actually navigate the stairs, lift him out, and get down. Uh, and that that was sort of a, a very stressful call on our people, based on sort of how it did not turn out well. Uh, but it was a sort of good teamwork, but it took I think over about an hour. So just a question, we we always have two engine companies on, right. so that, and two ambulances staff. Now what's the staff overlays, what's the shift like, 11 people? A uh, minimum of 12. So, <coughs> so you have um, basically your engine company and ambulances staff, and then you have your shift commander that sort of coordinates. So and four, eight guys on engines and four guys on ambulances. Because it's just my question, at what right. point would it behoove you to send two guys in an ambulance or assign to an engine company if you needed to? Definitely yep. did. Right. And, that, and that's what we do when there's a structural response. Mm -hmm. Basically, any available ambulance will go with them to back up on the fire scene, and we have the backup plan that we put in place. Mm -hmm. and, and then so. the ambulance is there, can be dispatched right. on the fire scene. If you need to right. Anything else on the paramedic engine? I'd just like to say, you know, one of the things is you can see Chris's passion for this. This has really been, as we started the program several years ago, we negotiated the ability to do this. But this has been sort of his baby that he's brought along and nurtured. If you went into his office, there was all sorts of junk all over the place. Now he can clean it up because it's actually on the engine company as far as today. So when it comes to making a difference in terms of service level, He's done an exceptional job. Um, along with that, um, we're looking at, through the Capital Improvements Committee, they've approved the uh, purchase of a new ambulance. So we got together, mm -hmm. the committee through the department, looked at all the different specifications, and that order will be in place this week for a new ambulance. One of the things that you'll see that we've tied it into is one of the initiatives continuing to go forward, and I always go back to uh, Councilor Murphy, um, control over time and uh, minimize injuries. And two years ago, we applied for a grant for power structures that was awarded to us with $55,000 for the purchase of five of those. So every ambulance now has a power structure in it, so that's kind of step one to minimize the lifting that our personnel are having to do. With this new ambulance, when we made the presentation, the one thing that we were adamant about is this new ambulance is going to have what they call a power load system in it. So when you uh, push the ambulance up against the, when you push the stretcher up against the back of the ambulance, basically it's almost like a set of forks comes out, grabs onto the stretcher, picks it up, and pulls it back in. So that is will help kind of round out and complete that ongoing injury prevention initiative that the chief and I have constantly strived to um, improve upon in our department. So that ambulance should be delivered uh, probably by the end of the calendar year. A 
along with that, when we did that same presentation for the Capital Improvements Committee, we kind of um, put it out there that through the next process, we're going to be looking for, at the time, it was around $90,000 we have to quote, to retrofit the other four ambulances with that same type of system to close out that process of injury prevention. We've been very fortunate. Um, it's hard to say how many injuries it's prevented because if we, you know, we've taken all the manual structures away from it, we've been fortunate. Would we have had more injuries if we didn't have the power structures? It's kind of hard to say. What we can definitively say is we have now secured the best equipment out there at this time for our personnel, and we're striving to continue to make improvements in the area of injury prevention. So going forward, um, we'll just be looking for support from this group to close out that project next year at the Capital Improvements uh, Committee request. Um, so, so fire and EMS have been consolidated together. This is the first year. It, it looks like right now, for this year, we will end with a surplus um, based on a number of people leaving. Uh, and we just rehired six positions to meet the requirements of the SAFER grant. Um, so, so this year, it looks pretty well that we're going to be in the black. There's no transfers necessary. Um, we're close on the OM side based on the number of repairs we can to have, which sort of reflects both aging fire trucks and ambulances. They're both expensive. Um, and then on the, the personnel side, we will have a surplus that we're projecting both in overtime right now and in overall salaries because those six positions were not there the entire time. Uh, in terms of overtime, it's a smaller surplus that we're projecting. And we're very conservative on that because that could change tomorrow if there was a major incident. And then so forth as we've seen. Uh, as far as next year's budget, was that your question is really more next year? Uh, yeah, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me go into next year's budget is uh, level funded, uh, working with the mayor to maintain the safer grant. Uh, and I think that the challenge is we have the requirement of the safer grant to maintain a number of staff, uh, but is there the fiscal ability to do so? So that's sort of an ongoing discussion and will in some ways be predicated by what um, what award there is given through the arbitration process. And then the uh, last couple final things just to uh, bring your attention. Um, again, we're always looking for opportunities to increase the um, knowledge and capabilities of our personnel. So through a series of grants that we applied um, for regionally around the area, we were awarded $90,000 for two classes for pre-hospital trauma life support um, that our personnel are able to attend as well as people from surrounding services can attend. Um, the first class will be May 18th and 19th. The second class will be June 29th and 30th. We were also awarded a grant in the amount of $25,000 for a one-day first responder pre-hospital trauma life support grant. That will be held April 20th. And then the other one, um, we applied for a regional grant to the uh, Homeland Security Funds. And that grant was to help fund 35, to train 35 people to become a basic EMT and 10 people to become paramedics. And that is in the process of being awarded in the amount of $130,000. And that one there benefits us both directly and indirectly. We have some interest from our people, obviously, to partake in that training and, and get trained to a higher level. But as I said, when you look at it, it's a regional grant that other services can get involved in. And when, as I mentioned earlier, we go to all the different news around us. One of the challenges is they have not many personnel to assist, help out, or begin care prior to our arrival. This is going to help minimize our on-scene times out there and give our people um, additional people on scene that are trained to assist them, provide better care, and get them back here to the hospital. Now you're, you're starting to run out of people that don't have medical ratings, aren't you? I mean, all your hires are 13, yeah. right now. 13.
13 left that that are, first, that are classified as first responders. Only. So, uh, so one of those programs deals with how to increase sort of the level of knowledge and expertise at the first responder level. Um, but I think it's great that they're both regional programs that really does sort of take what we've started here and expand it out a little bit. So when the Federal Fire Act grant is awarded, you'll hear it's a Northampton grant. We're the host community for that, but it's open to any Hampshire County uh, any member of Hampshire County that can participate. Just repeat the grant is 130000 from DHS. That's correct. And for it's for paramedic and? For paramedic training and basic EMT training. Okay. Uh, 10 paramedics and 35 basic EMTs, and that's uh, region wide. And of the 13, how many of those personnel you say are just sort of finishing off their career and are not going to pursue, you know, they just, they're happy with where they are and they've got a couple of years left of service? Interestingly enough, one of the people that I heard wants to take the EMT class through this is one of the most senior people in the department. Really? So, so I think we have a couple that I'm starting to hear a little rumble in. Exactly. It's, it's, might, might retire within six months, might retire in a year, something like that. But then there's a middle group that I'd say they have three to five years left. And, and they're seeing what's going on and they're working with it and becoming more comfortable to the point that at least some of them want to pursue this. So we, we've offered this a couple of times before. Um, but it, it's interesting that as the program matures, we have a little bit of ongoing interest. Because three to five years is worth the investment. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, two, two more things real quick. Um, in addition to that, we talked earlier about capital projects. And every ambulance we have has to have the capability when it goes on a call to do a electronic patient care report. So we have four laptops. Um, and each of the, uh, out of the five ambulances, four of those have laptops and printers assigned to them. Those were bought back in September of 2008, so they're getting old and have taken a beat and getting brought in and out of ambulances in, in hospitals, high rises, things like that. So we are um, in the process of getting those replaced free of charge through a grant as well. Those should be coming in about 30 days. So we're actually pretty fortunate to be looking at those here as well. That's four laptops? Four laptops. Uh, what kind? How much? Uh, they're about $4,500 a piece. They're going to be Panasonic CF-19s. And then the last thing is, I talked, I mentioned earlier Dr. Conway. Dr. Conway is our medical director. We work under his license as paramedics and uh, pre-hospital providers. And Again, he, over, he oversees the quality assurance, um, improvement, um, training, things like that. And every report that we submit to the hospital, he or one of his designees has to review to make sure we follow all the state protocols and things of that nature. It's continually challenging for him and his staff to keep up with it and keep things current and provide us timely feedback. So through our software system, we now have the ability, both internally and externally with his staff, to look at this under a secure website, um, under Ambulco Web. He can log on under any internet site and now review our calls, pull calls up for quality assurance. If a call went to Bay State and had a question on it from his house or from his phone, he can pull that up anytime. So it gives him immediate access, immediate feedback, they can get us reports back in a more timely manner so we can co correct it if needed a lot quicker. Um, so he was very happy with that. Um, and right now, all the other services have to do basically a paper trail and a report for them. So we've eliminated that as well. And that's the end of my report. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any One question, would you be interested in the next time we do an EMS report, having one of our ambulances provided, it's available to come down with some of the, the tools and techniques. As Chris mentioned, we've sort of taken the cutting edge in terms of implementing, whether it's technology or you talked about ET tubes where we have a little video camera that as you put the tube in, it shows you where it is, thus leading to a higher success rate. Um, the guys use uh, what's called an EZIO, which is a drill that goes into your bone to administer medication. And
and some of the things uh, are, are just phenomenal. The CPR machines we have have increased our save rate fairly dramatically. And we have other communities in the area coming to us and saying, we wish we had some of these tools to do the job. Um, so you know, as we've sort of matured the service, I'm not sure if it's worthwhile spending a few minutes and having a couple of our paramedics come in and walk you through that. Right, we'd have to see if you make Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'd like to see some of the trends here from previous years or more than one. I, tr I take your word for it. I hope I'm never inside of one of them. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> I would. I agree with that. I, I, for me, I really have always found it interesting to see comparisons of like, how, how we've done the past years. I remember, like, for example, the mayor in his budget last year put in that comparison, five year comparison. I'm not asking you to buy your comparison right. or anything that's going to be onerous, but I find that sort of thing um, really informative. Okay. Yeah, because I do kind of remember the call volume dropping over the years, but I'd rather see anyone really look at the graphs, but it'd be helpful to actually see the reports over time. If, if you want, do you want me to do, uh, go back, I can go back three years, and I can. If I went back three years as a starting point and pulled the same reports, so if I did each year separately, that would give us three snapshots in time to look at. Annualized. Exactly. Yeah. Well, as a start, as a starting point. However you, I mean, however you want, how you, however the software allows you to. Sure. If you could do that, and then maybe this is a suggestion. Uh, if you could send that before the meeting and just bring your updated one, so we can keep it, the meeting basically the same length but have more information. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, when, when would you like that? That is my next question. Uh, whenever, I mean, when we yeah. yeah, next yeah. one, the so, report, if that's, if that's so it'll be probably possible. fall time? Yeah, probably fall time. Sometimes fall. It's so possible. Yeah, so in the fall, I'll do, uh, I'll have, I'll do three separate years and we can look at that. And then going forward, if that doesn't work, we can manipulate it and, and do other things with it. That'll be a starting point anyways. That'll be true. Yeah, thank absolutely. That's great. Thank you for the report. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. Have a good night.